live in interesting times. For the headlines. Super Typhoon Mangkut has further intensified as it continued to move westward towards Luzon and forecasters predicting that the Super Typhoon could reach wind speeds nearing the intensity of Super Typhoon Haiyan. Hurricane Florence tracks towards the U.S. East Coast, prompting authorities to order more than a million people to evacuate. It is even more disturbing. A UN report says extreme weather events were a leading cause of global hunger rising last year with women, babies and old people particularly vulnerable to the worsening trend. And the United States threatens to arrest and sanction judges and other officials of the International Criminal Court if it moves to charge any American who served in Afghanistan with war crimes. Mama Angeles, wherever you're watching from around the world, thank you very much for joining us. We welcome our viewers here in the Philippines and around the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Cepeda. And now to the news. Super Typhoon Mangkut has further intensified as it continued to move westward towards Luzon. And forecasters are predicting that the Super Typhoon could reach wind speeds nearing the intensity of Super Typhoon Haiyan upon its expected entry into the country by tomorrow evening, Wednesday, September 12. The eye of Typhoon Mangkut as of 4 a.m. Tuesday, September 11, was located at 1,820 kilometers east of southern Luzon with maximum sustained winds of up to 160 kilometers per hour and gustiness of up to 195 kilometers per hour. It's moving west at 30 kilometers per hour. This typhoon is expected to enter the Philippine area of responsibility tomorrow, September 12, according to Pagasa. The wind speed is comparable to that of Super Typhoon Yolanda or Haiyan in November of 2013, which the Japan Meteorological Agency said had maximum 10-minute sustained winds to 230 kilometers per hour, the highest in relation to the cyclone. Meanwhile, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council was placed on red alert status on Tuesday. Ang preparation natin is uh, level ng uh, Yolanda. Of course, we have learned a lot after Yolanda. No, hindi, hindi naman ibig sabihin that uh, Mangkut is of the same magnitude as Yolanda, but uh, well, anything could happen kasi lumalakas pa siya habang uh, lumalapit siya sa Philippine Area of uh, Responsibility. And the RRMC spokesperson Edgar Posada said the DSWD in coordination with the LGUs and local disaster risk reduction and management offices have already pre-positioned relief food packs and rescue equipment. Rescue teams are also deployed in Clark and Kawayan Airport. Noon kasi parang Di ba lahat sumugod tayo doon, yung mga decision makers were all there. Uh, God forbid, baka na-wipe out pa sila doon. Ano? Kung, so who would lead? No? Ngayon, ang, ang ano natin is we leave the, the levels of response to the different levels in place. Ano? In that order, kung hindi na nila kaya, uh, saka tayo papasok. Posadas, however, urged the public, particularly those living in low-lying and mountainous areas, to prepare for possible evacuation due to possible flooding and landslides. Uh, hopefully, yung ating mga kababayan eh, makiisa sa atin. No? Uh, mahirap din kasi, we, the government has uh, the prerogative on the forced evacuation as well. No? Pero sana, pakiusapan lang muna na lipat lang muna tayo pansamantala. Balik ka na lang, para ka lang nag-weekend, balik ka na lang uli after the weekend para at least... Uh, 
Pagasa also said Mangkut or Ompong may intensify into a super typhoon, which has maximum sustained winds of exceeding to 220 kilometers per hour. Meanwhile, tropical storm Neneng or Barijat has intensified into a tropical storm while moving westward towards southern Japan. As of 8 a.m. Tuesday, September 11, the center of the tropical storm was located at 350 kilometers west of extreme northern Luzon or already outside the Philippine area of responsibility. The Philippine Coast Guard has alerted its districts and stations in northern and central Luzon to brace for the possible effects in maritime activities of a tropical storm that is forecast to develop into super typhoon Ompong, international name Mangkut, once it enters the Philippine waters on Wednesday. In a news release issued Tuesday, PCG Commandant Admiral Elson Hermogino directed all PCG district commanders in areas expected to be hit by the super typhoon to ensure the readiness of all assets and personnel to respond during emergency situations. Hermogino ordered all PCG personnel to coordinate with the respective regional disaster risk reduction and management councils for possible rescue and related activities. He also directed BCG units to remind and prevent all types of inter-island inter vessels from sailing in the areas where public storm signal will be possibly hoisted by the Philippine Atmospheric, Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration. The riding public is advised to check with their shipping companies for the possible cancellation of their trips, especially those traveling to northern Luzon Southern Tagalog region or Southern Tagalog region and nearby provinces. The PCG is also informing all participating agencies in the annual international coastal cleanup that the activity will be scheduled on September 22. At the instruction of Transportation Secretary Arthur Tugade, the PCG is coordinating with the Philippine Ports Authority to prepare the necessary facilities and provisions in case passengers are stranded in ports because of the typhoon. And to the U.S. now, powerful Hurricane Florence was tracking towards the U.S. east coast prompting authorities order to order upwards of 1 million people to evacuate the path of the extremely dangerous storm forecasters said could soon intensify. South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster ordered as many as 1 million residents of the state's eastern coast to leave their homes ahead of the storm's possible arrival on Thursday. Yeah, it'll be dumping water on us in North Carolina, all of which will come flow through South Carolina, much of what is in North Carolina, so we're liable to have a whole lot of flooding, particularly in the PD area. So we got the hurricane and the surge, which may be as high as 10 feet, maybe more, maybe less, we don't know, coming at us uh, from the ocean, and then after that we have water coming down, flooding us. So we, we're in for a real episode here. We know that this evacuation order that I'm issuing is going to be inconvenient for some people, it's going to be inconvenient, but we do not want to risk one South Carolina life in this hurricane, so we're willing to suffer some inconvenience. Meanwhile, the governor of neighboring North Carolina also ordered an evacuation of the Outer Banks and parts of coastal Dare County while a state of emergency was declared in Virginia. North Carolina is taking Hurricane Florence seriously, and you should too. Get ready now. Today I've asked the President for a disaster declaration on behalf of North Carolina so that we can get federal help as soon as possible. We know that this has already just turned into a Category 3 storm. It could be Category 4 by the time it gets here. Uh, those are high winds, and debris can cause significant damage uh, and even injury or death. We've alerted or activated all of our resources. We think that this is going to be a, a statewide event, much like the governor was talking about. There really is a serious threat from dangerous winds, dangerous coastal storm surge, 
and also dangerous riverine flooding caused by high amounts of precipitation. So we have to take this storm very seriously. Now, Hurricane Florence has the potential to bring catastrophic flooding to areas of the eastern United States, already soaked by heavy rain and may be the strongest storm to hit the region in decades. A Category 4 on the five-level Safir Simpson hurricane scale, Florence was 575 miles south-southeast of Bermuda, and the center of the hurricane was forecast to pass between Bermuda and the Bahamas on Tuesday and Wednesday, according to the National Hurricane Center. Yeah, I'm getting batteries for the combine and uh, a couple of the trucks and also a couple for the generators. I'm excited that I got the batteries in time before it was sold out and I'm needing for my lantern. I am very concerned. Storm surge and hurricane watches may be issued early Tuesday U.S. time for portions of southeastern U.S. states, according to the National Hurricane Center. On its current track, Florence is expected to slam the Carolinas and Virginia the hardest. Don't concentrate on the exact forecast track of Hurricane Florence, the National Weather Service warned. It said significant effects will extend outside the cone and will arrive at the coast sooner than the eye. U.S. President Donald Trump has received a very positive letter from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un seeking a follow-up meeting after their historic summit in Singapore, the White House said Monday. It was a uh, very warm, very positive letter. Uh, we won't release the full letter unless the North Korean leader agrees that we should. Uh, the primary purpose of the letter was to request and uh, look to schedule another meeting with the president, uh, which we are open to and are already in the process of coordinating that. White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders added that the letter was further evidence of progress in Washington's relationship with Pyongyang. Sanders also cited the parade in her comments. Um, the most recent parade this weekend, one of the uh, first times I believe that we have, they have had a uh, parade similar where they weren't highlighting their nuclear arsenal. We consider that a sign of good faith. And again, uh, the letter from uh, Kim Jong-un to the president certainly showed a commitment to continuing conversations. Trump and Kim held a historic summit in Singapore in June but raised prospects of a breakthrough on curtailing North Korea's nuclear program. Pyongyang's letter comes a day after Yukiya Amano, the head of the UN's nuclear watchdog, warned that North Korea's ongoing nuclear activities violated UN Security Council resolutions. International inspectors are banned from North Korea, but Mr. Amano said they were ready to return if a political agreement could be reached. In other news, the United States threatened to arrest and sanction judges and other officials of the International Criminal Court if it moves to charge any American who served in Afghanistan with war crimes. White House National Security Advisor John Bolton called the Hague-based rights body unaccountable. The United States will use any means necessary to protect our citizens and those of our allies from unjust prosecution by this illegitimate court. We will not cooperate with the ICC. We will provide no assistance to the ICC. And we certainly will not join the ICC. A 2016 report from the ICC said there was a reasonable basis to believe the U.S. military had committed torture at secret detention sites in Afghanistan operated by the CIA and that the Afghan government and the Taliban had committed war crimes. He said the U.S. was prepared to slap financial sanctions and criminal charges on officials of the court if they proceed against any Americans. We will ban its judges and prosecutors from entering the United States. We will sanction their funds in the U.S. financial system, and we will prosecute them in the U.S. criminal system. We will do the same for any company or state 
that assists an ICC investigation of Americans. No committee of foreign nations will tell us how to govern ourselves and defend our freedom. We will stand up for the U.S. Constitution abroad, just as we do at home. And as always, in every decision we make, we will put the interests of the American people first. Now, the second area Bolton addressed was the Palestinian move to bring Israel before the ICC over allegations of human rights abuses in Gaza and the occupied West Bank, a move dismissed by Israel as politicized. Now, Bolton said the Palestinian move was one of the reasons the U.S. administration had decided to close the Palestinians' diplomatic mission in Washington. We will let the ICC die on its own. After all, for all intents and purposes, the ICC is already dead to us. The United States will always stand with our friend and ally, Israel. <clears throat> and today, reflecting congressional concern with Palestinian attempts to prompt an ICC investigation of Israel, the Department of State will announce the closure of the Palestine Liberation Organization office here in Washington, D.C. The UN's new humanitarian chief warned Monday that a large-scale military operation against the rebel-held Syrian province of Idlib could create the worst humanitarian catastrophe of this century. But our top-line message is there needs to be um, ways of dealing with this problem that don't turn the next few months in Idlib into the worst humanitarian catastrophe with the biggest loss of life of the 21st century. Let me start by just underlining how alarmed we all are by what a dangerous moment this is for, um, for the people of Italy. There's something like 4 million people in that area, in the, the broadest definition of the area, 3 million people in what was previously the de-escalation zone, and uh, more than 2 million people who are reliant on assistance. And his remarks came as Syrian troops, backed by Russia and Iran, massed around the south or northwestern province ahead of an expected onslaught against the rebel-held or largest rebel-held zone left in the country. Since 2015, Idlib has been home to a complex array of anti-regime forces, secular rebels, Islamists, Syrian jihadists with ties to Al-Qaeda and their foreign counterparts. It is home to some three million people, around half of them displaced from other parts of the country, according to the United Nations. A majority military operation in Idlib is expected to pose a humanitarian nightmare because there is no nearby opposition territory left in Syria where people could be evacuated to. Serious conflict has killed more than 350,000 people and forced millions more out of their homes. In other news, Russia on Tuesday launched what it has called its largest ever military drills with hundreds of thousands of Russian troops taking part along with Chinese soldiers in a massive show of force that has rattled the West. The week-long war games dubbed Vostok 2018, East 2018 have kicked off in far eastern Russia and on the Pacific Ocean. The defense ministry said in a statement, it released video footage of military vehicles, planes, helicopters, and ships getting into position for the initial stage of the drills. The drills, which include the Chinese and Mongolian armies, have been condemned by NATO as a rehearsal for large-scale conflict. President Vladimir Putin is expected to attend the Vostok 2018 after hosting an economic forum in Russia's far eastern city of Vladivostok, where his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping is one of the prominent guests. The military exercises come at a time of escalating tensions between Moscow and the West over accusations of Russian interference in Western affairs and ongoing conflicts in Ukraine and Syria. The Russian army has compared the show of force to the USSR's 1981 war games that saw between 100,000 and 150,000 Warsaw Pact soldiers take part in Zapad 81 or West 81, the largest military exercises of the Soviet era. 
But Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said these exercises are even larger with 300 soldiers, 36,000 military vehicles, 1,000 planes and 80 warships taking part in the drills. Russia's territorial dispute with Japan over the Kuril Islands was unlikely to be settled soon. President Vladimir Putin said Monday, seeming to pour cold water on his Japanese counterparts, more optimistic forecast. Разумеется, в ходе переговоров затронули проблему мирного договора. Как известно, вопрос этот обсуждается многие десятилетия. И было бы наивно полагать, что можно решить его в одночасье. Но мы готовы искать развязки, которые устроили бы и Россию, и Японию, и которые будут приняты народами обеих стран. Уверен, что по итогам столь насыщенного визита премьер-министра Японии в Россию, двусторонние отношения получат новый импульс и продолжат развиваться в духе партнерства и сотрудничества. Благодарю вас за внимание. Putin said Moscow and Tokyo have made some progress in building cooperation and economic ties on the four southernmost islands in the Kuril chain, which the Soviet Union occupied at the end of the World War II, but are claimed by Japan. The dispute kept the two countries from ever signing a peace accord. Prime Minister Abe told President Putin that Moscow and Tokyo face a difficult task but the two leaders share mutual confidence in the pursuing the negotiations. The two also confirmed that Putin will travel to Japan on the official, on an official visit next year, Abby said. In other news, 50 people died when a bus carrying Hindu pilgrims plunged into a valley in southern India, one of the deadliest accidents on the country's notorious roads in recent years. Now, road crashes in India claim the lives of more than 150,000 people each year. Most accidents are blamed on poor roads, badly maintained vehicles, and reckless driving. The bus carrying 80 people was returning from the famous Hindu temple of Kondagatu. Anjaneya Swami in the hilly southern state of Telangana when it skidded off the road. Some rescuers climbed onto the bus and others tried to reach the injury through the front portion which was completely smashed. Now more than half of those killed were women and there were at least three children according to local official G. Narenhandar. Broadcaster NDTV quoted witnesses as saying the driver was speeding and lost control of the vehicle. The Hindu daily said it careened off the road on a sharp corner. An investigation has been ordered. Eagle News International will be right back. Is there more?
three-day Eastern Economic Forum begins in Vladivostok and will see leaders from Russia, China, Japan and South Korea attending as well as delegates and businessmen from across the globe. The forum will be held on September 11 to 13. The forum's key event, a plenary session of Far East, expanding the range of possibilities, will be attended by the heads of five states and governments, Russia's President Vladimir Putin, China's President Xi Jinping, President of Mongolia, Khal Magin Batulga, Prime Minister of Japan Shinzo Abe, and Prime Minister of South Korea, Li nak -yon. The participants will touch upon the plans to speed up the socio-economic development of the Far East, ways to attract Russian and foreign investors to the region. The international agenda in particular includes the decision or discussion of security and stability in the Asia-Pacific region. Meanwhile, Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba and Russian technology group Mail.ru said they would launch a joint e-commerce venture in Russia and former Soviet countries. Take a look. So what we bring from China is all the experience that we have and all the technology that we have in building an enormous e-commerce cloud payments business. And we bring that to Russia with the full understanding that, of course, we will comply with all the rules and the regulations, but we'll do it with our partners at the RDIF, at Mail.ru, at Megaphone, in a way that will be very differentiated from our competitors. So. The deal comes as e-commerce is developing rapidly in Russia, though hindered by the country's vast size and problematic infrastructure, including an often unreliable postal service. Now, the two groups, along with the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund, RDIF, and telecom operator Megafon, announced the creation of a strategic partnership as Russia hosts an economic forum in the far eastern city of Vladivostok. The new company will be called AliExpress Russia, based on the name of an existing Alibaba platform. It'll be 48% owned by Alibaba, 24% by Megafon, 15% by Mail.ru, and 13% by the RDIF. Russia's RBK Media Group reported that the RDIF would invest up to $300 million. The deal involves Megafon selling Alibaba its 10% stake in Mail.ru. Alibaba, co-founded by tech billionaire Jack Ma in 1999, reported revenues of $39.9 billion for the year ending March. It already plays a major role in e-commerce in Russia through its AliExpress and Tmall platforms. The World Economic Forum on ASEAN or WEF ASEAN themed ASEAN 4.0 Entrepreneurship and the Fourth Industrial Revolution opens today in Hanoi. The event, which lasts three days, attracts more than 1,000 people, including six presidents or prime ministers. Watch this. Uh, Aniko, you're a professor, and all these people are students here, so they're used to hearing professors. <laughs> Do you think, Annie, that ASEAN and the region is prepared to embrace the fourth industrial revolution. But at the heart of ASEAN is the ASEAN way, but at the same time identifying with ASEAN. So I would like to see cross-cultural movement. I'd like to see a lot more exchange between students across the 10 countries. And that's how we build identity. The next I, and I think Minister spoke about it very powerfully, is innovation. We need to unlock the enormous entrepreneurial skills within ASEAN once, and through technology you could leapfrog, you could actually not be inundated with legacy. The third I to me is very important, it's about inclusiveness. I think the more we have technology, the greater the digital divide. And so while I wrote about having the sixth sense of digital skills, there are still many people within ASEAN, within individual countries that do not have access to healthcare, to payments, to financial accounts, and even to education. And my last I is integration. I think we do not work hard enough. We, we need more hard work 
integration calls for working. So what role does a company like Google play in spreading innovation in a region like ASEAN? So look, when it, when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution, at the core of it is a digital economy, right? And when you think about ASEAN, the 10 countries combined, uh, and the digital economy in ASEAN, it's actually quite sizable, growing very rapidly, but it's got enormous potential. So one way we look at sort of the digital economy is as a percentage of overall GDP. So if you look at digital economy as a percentage of overall economy in ASEAN, it's about 7%. China's at about 16%, the top five EU countries at about 25%, the US is at about 35%, right? So in terms of full potential of the digital economy in ASEAN, we've got about five times growth that we, that we can achieve. And, and achieving that as an ASEAN, uh, as a group of ASEAN countries, really is about making sure that we have one integrated digital economy, mm. all right? So what does that really mean? I think it's very important to have uh, free flow of data across across countries. It's important to have seamless payments across across countries, and finally, uh, for for goods and services as well to move across these countries, right? But all of that still won't actually uh, help uh, ASEAN achieve its full potential. The most important uh, to 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 uh, address one of the concerns or issues that Professor raised, which is how do we make sure that humans win over machines is skills, right? And, and I think skilling is by far the single most important thing. And as a company, as, as Google, we've specifically focused on skilling. And skilling uh, at all levels, right? For students, for developers, uh, for, for entrepreneurs, and also small and medium businesses. And today, I wanted to take a minute on small and medium businesses. If you look at small and medium enterprises, SMEs, in, in ASEAN, they account for about 50% of all GDP in the region, and they account for 80% of all jobs in ASEAN are actually small and medium enterprises. And if you think about how will ASEAN capture the full potential of the digital economy, we believe that probably the single biggest uh, level or you know, in, you know, area that we should focus on is skilling these small and medium enterprises to be able to capitalize on the digital economy. And on that front, uh, Amrita, we, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to announce today that uh, we should be able to announce Meanwhile, Google committed to train 3 million small and medium enterprise owners and employees on digital skills in Southeast Asia by 2020. Take a look. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to announce today that uh, officially we are going to announce that uh, as Google, we are committing to train 3 million uh, small and medium uh, enterprise owners and employees on digital skills by the year 2020. So, so across the 10 countries, uh, we will commit to training uh, and making sure that these small and medium enterprises, therefore, can really get the best benefit, best out of uh, get, get the best out of digital and the fourth uh, industrial revolution, which is how do we make sure that humans win over machines is skills, right? And and I think skilling is by far the single most important thing. And as a company as as Google, we specifically focus on skilling. And skilling uh, at all levels, right? For students, for developers, uh, for, for entrepreneurs, and also small and medium businesses. By, uh, at the age of Participants at the open forum, including governmental and corporate officials, scholars, and students, focused their discussions on how to ensure that the potential offered by startups and entrepreneurship will create a brighter future for everyone. The WEF, established in 1971, is a non-profit foundation headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. The forum engages the foremost political business and other leaders of society to shape global, regional and industry agendas. I like to think of it as the four eyes. More news will be coming your way when Eagle News International returns.
MTRCV ang mag-provide ng appropriate ratings sa lahat ng TV shows. Para ugaliin ng pamilya ang responsabling panonood. Be more time, parents! Rated G, good for all! Good rated PG! Dapat may mga magulang para sagutin ang mga anong ng kabataan. Sabi, rated SPG! Masaman! Ikutan ang paggabay. Pag-rated MTRCB, rated responsable. Extreme weather events were a leading cause of global hunger rising last year with women, babies, and old people particularly vulnerable to the worsening trend, a UN report said Tuesday. Increasingly frequent shocks such as extreme rainfall or temperatures as well as droughts, storms, and floods helped push the number of undernourished people to 821 million in 2017, it said. That figure, equivalent to about one in nine people globally, was up from 804 million in 2016, according to the annual report, The State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World. Low- and middle-income countries, in particular, were harshly impacted by ever more frequent climate extremes. The report said, Africa is the region where climate shocks and stressors have the biggest impact on acute food insecurity and malnutrition affecting 59 million people in 24 countries and requiring urgent humanitarian action. Trends were also worsening in South America. It added that, I quote, if we are to achieve a world without hunger and malnutrition in all its forms by 2030, it is imperative that we accelerate and scale up actions to strengthen the resilience and adaptive capacity of food systems and people's livelihoods in response to climate variability and extremes. The world risks crossing the point of no return on climate change with disastrous consequences for the people across the planet and the natural systems that sustain them. This is according to the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez warning on Monday and calling for more leadership and greater ambition for climate action to reverse course. Take a look. Today I'm appealing for leadership from politicians, from business and scientists, and from the public everywhere. We have the tools to make our actions effective. What we still lack, even after the Paris Agreement, is the leadership and the ambition to do what is needed. And what makes all of this even more disturbing is that we were warned. Scientists have been telling us for decades, over and over again, and far too many leaders have refused to listen. And far too few have acted with the vision the science demands. And we see the results. In some situations, they are approaching scientists' worst-case scenarios. The world's richest nations are the most responsible for the climate crisis, yet the effects are being felt first and worst by the poorest nations and the most vulnerable peoples and communities. Existing technologies are waiting to come online. Cleaner fuels, alternative building materials, better batteries, and advances in farming and land use. And these and other innovations can have a major role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions so we can hit the Paris targets and inject the great ambition that is so urgently needed. Let us use the next year for transformational decisions in boardrooms, executive suites, and parliaments across the world. Let us raise our sights, build coalitions, and make our leaders listen. There is no more time to waste. As the ferocity of this summer's wildfires and heat waves shows, the world is changing before our eyes. We are careering towards the edge of the abyss. 
It is not too late to shift course, but every day that passes means the world eats up a little more and the cost of our inaction mounts. Every day we fail to act is a day that we step a little closer towards a fate that none of us want. A fate that will resonate through generations in the damage done to humankind and life on Earth. Our fate is in our hands. The world is counting on all of us to rise to the challenge before it is too late. I count on you all. The news continues here on Eagle News International. We'll be right back. Broadcasting Corporation marks its 50th year. It is conducting several activities under the theme EBC Cares, enabling a better community. Health and nutrition are key factors on child's learning and well-being. EBC's feeding program encourages the community to combat malnutrition among children and ensure them a healthy future. EBC's cleanup drive and citronella planting hopes to help the community in caring for environment and preventing diseases such as dengue. EBC's public service program, Pagilingkod sa Bayan, Servisyo para sa Mamayan, has opened its doors to government agencies so more people can avail of these services. EBC's blood donation program and medical mission continue to spearhead life-saving projects and EBC's livelihood seminar teaches and guides those who want to have additional income and business. EBC Cares, serving the people in these interesting times. In tennis, Martina Navratilova, an 18 Grand Slam singles champion, says Serena Williams was wrong in her outburst at the U.S. Open Women's Finals even though she agreed there is a double standard. Writing an opinion article for the New York Times, the 61-year-old Czech-born American said a higher standard needed to be observed when Williams called chair umpire Carlos Ramos a thief and was penalized a key game in the second set. We cannot measure ourselves by what we think we should also be able to get away with it. Navrita Loba wrote, In fact, this is the sort of behavior that no one should be engaging in on the court. Williams, who was thwarted in her bid for a record time 24 slam singles crown in losing to Japan's Naomi Osaka, said she was punished for saying something where men have said far worse without incurring such a penalty. 
Williams was issued a warning for coaching, something her coach sitting in the stands, Patrick Maratoglu, admitted to doing. Williams was unhappy at the violation call and complained to Ramos she hadn't taken any signals. Williams later smashed a racket resulting in a code violation and a point deduction which he argued over with Ramos. Matters escalated and Williams called Ramos a thief incurring the crucial game penalty. In NBA, Britain's Luol Deng has signed a one-year NBA deal with the Minnesota Timberwolves, becoming the fourth former Chicago Bulls player to join ex-Bulls coach Tom Thibodeau's squad. The 33-year-old South Sudanese-born forward, reportedly set to make $2.4 million in his 15th NBA campaign, spent his first nine and a half league seasons with the Bulls before being traded to Cleveland. Deng has also played for the Miami Heat and Los Angeles Lakers, who waived him earlier this month. Thibodeau now has former Chicago players Jimmy Butler, Taj Gibson, and Derrick Rose on the roster of a team jokingly dubbed the Timber Bulls. Deng also joined a Minnesota lineup featuring center Deng Adele, a South Sudanese-born Australian, and Senegalese forward Gorgi Dieng. Deng has averaged 15 points, 6.1 rebounds, 2.3 assists, and 1 steals a game in 880 appearances over 14 NBA seasons. With Thibodeau and the Bulls, Deng reached the 2011 Eastern Conference Finals in more than three seasons together from 2010 to 2014 averages 16.8 points and 6.2 rebounds. Deng credited Thibodeau for maximizing his talent into All-Star form, reaching the NBA All-Star Game in 2012 and 2013. In football, Argentine legend Diego Maradona described his decision to coach second division Mexican club Dorados as a rebirth after years battling addictions as he officially became the team's new manager on Monday. Maradona, who has publicly struggled with drug addiction, alcoholism, and obesity, raised eyebrows with the decision to accept a job in the heart of Mexican drug cartel country, the rough and tumble state of Sinaloa. But in his first press conference for Dorados, he described the job as a healthy new beginning after a long sickness alluding the successes of his past. Mexico was the scene of Maradona's greatest triumph as a player, leading Argentina to the 1986 World Cup title almost single-handedly according to some. And these are the stories for EN Sports. I'm Ben Bernaldez and I'm 1 to 25. Heading now to Finland, our EBC correspondent Christina Sabawang takes us to a tour of Helsinki. This is Christina, and this time I am on my way to Helsinki, Finland. Finland is a country in the northern Europe. Come, join me, and let's explore this beautiful city. Finland is bordered by the countries of Norway, Sweden, Russia, and also by the Baltic Sea in the south. Finland's southern capital city is Helsinki, which has been since 1812. Helsinki is also the largest city of the country. You can get around the city by bus, tram, or take the northernmost subway in the world, the Helsinki Metro. Just do not forget to buy day tickets that works for all the transportations in the city and allows you to have a less expensive trip too. Because of the city's great designs, it attracted design lovers all over the world. And Helsinki was voted as the world design capital for 2012 by the International Council of Societies of Industrial Design. Even though Helsinki is the most populated area in the country, Helsinki is considered as a city of greenery. That is because you can never be far from a park here. Helsinki is also close to the sea and is surrounded by nature. A third of the city consists of parks and other green areas. And if you opt for a closer look at nature sightseeing, Helsinki's city bikes are all over the city. 
rent one and do not be shy to ring the bell as you explore this beautiful city. Helsinki is a city with long cold months and the temperature can drop up to negative 20 in winter. But a visit in a city with fresh air and warm saunas is a worthy trip. Just like what the Finns say, there's no such thing as bad weather, it's just a matter of proper clothing. This is Christina Sumawang and I'm always one with 25. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Christina. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Tumblr. Also, check out our ports and pictures and pictures on Instagram. I'm Sam Zepeda. Thanks for joining us. And that's it for tonight's broadcast. I'm Alma Angeles and... We're, We're one with 25!